Mr. Chair, our next witness will be 451 on page 51 Thank of your you. bundle. Good evening, Mr. Witness. Can you hear me? Bale, bale. Yes, I can hear you. I'm going to... The, Mr. Chairman is going to ask you some questions before we begin. Mr. Witness, uh, thank you very much for attending to testify. Would you repeat after me, please? I solemnly declare that I will speak the truth. Can you hear me, Mr. Witness? I don't think he can hear me. You, you don't, is that the translator? You don't think he can uh, hear you? Uh, man, uh, uh, man, but when I can't see that I'm sad that you shouldn't be sure you to see that. Yes, it's very difficult for me to hear the sound, and I cannot hear the interpreter sometime because it's very intermittent. Ah, should we try again then? Let's just see. Would you repeat after me, Mr. Witness? I do solemnly declare that I will speak the truth. Salam. No, it looks as though the line is not very... I solemnly, I solemnly uh, swear. I solemnly swear. Yes, he just said that. I solemnly swear. That I will speak the truth. Can I speak the truth? The nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, there'll be questions now from the prosecution, and then there'll be uh, probably some questions from the panel. Counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Witness, uh, we're aware of the security concerns that you have, so I'm going to start with one broad question, and then we will ask the journalists to leave the room and I will ask you questions to follow up. Can you please describe to us what you saw during the days of the Aban protests? I have no connection. I have lost connection. My, uh, I am trying to connect. We are okay now, yes. We've been connected. When on the 20, 16th of November, the people were only supposed to bring their cars to the streets and turn off the engines in protest against the fuel hike, the price hike. And it in the first, very first minutes that I uh, went to the hospital for work, and and the people had turned off their engines as I was going to hospital, and they were all standing 
um, the corners of the street without doing anything. They were just standing. Because of the traffic as a result of the people leaving their cars and turning the engines off, the Basij militia and the IRGC forces and also the police. Among them, there were also intelligence officers. Without any warning, they used their Klashnikov to fire at towards the people, in the direction of the people. So in the very first minutes, it was as if I was witnessing a war scene. What I saw in a hospital was that bodies were arriving, either they were dead or they were injured. The security forces had control of the hospital. That, uh, in other words, they would come and uh, check the bodies and those that had uh, bullets in them. They would remove their um, any personal IDs and um, um, anyone who was injured. After identifying them, they would uh, handcuff them. And they would uh, handcuff them to their beds, hospital beds, to allow the doctors to carry on the pre preliminary examination. The, those whose injury were not very serious were just taken away by the security forces. There were even some who were not in the protest at all. They were just uh, simply passers by, yet they had been they, uh, they had uh, been shot either in the chest or the head, and their bodies were just lying there, and their families did not know what had happened to them. And those who had died, I was trying to move them to the uh, mortuary. And because the morgue was full, I had to use um, first. I and, uh, and I had to take some of those uh, bodies. Try, I was trying to move some of those bodies. And when we, when I was taking them to the morgue. The security forces of the intelligence unit who were there in plain clothes were checking those who had the bodies with bullets uh, in them to to be to see if uh, it was a, a military bullet or it was just a sporadic uh, one. Nobody else was allowed to enter except them. And they were investigating them personally, and they would remove the bullets. They were removing the bullets from the bodies, and they kept the bodies for uh, three or four days. And uh, their families would uh, were asked to come and identify the bodies and go to the and uh, also uh, give them their commitments so not to uh, hold any funerals or services for them and not to uh, have uh, any black uh, clothing. And those who were being removed to provinces, cities in the provinces, their relatives had to come and 
and promise that they will not hold any services for them in any of the towns uh, from which they came, nor would they give any um, and nor would they speak to any reporters or give any interviews. And um, when the bodies were being, those bodies that were being taken to various townships in provinces, sometimes security forces in um, plain clothes, they would escort them uh, in a way that wasn't too conspicuous. until reaching the destination and then the local office officers would come and take over and take the bodies to the um, to the cemetery and this is what this is this what you wanted me to tell you and so we could just just take the bodies and uh, we were not allowed to take the bodies back to their families, to their homes, in a way. And the first night I was on shift, and uh, the, whenever the people, um, people would um, withdraw every time the officers attacked them, and um, the people who were driven away by the forces would uh, they were trying to destroy some vehicles the the forces were trying to do that to destroy the vehicles and also shoot at uh, the protesters and the only way people were defending themselves by using stones and and uh, i had to pass all these officers and the people the protesters and the protesters outside the petrol station um But the people had not damaged the petrol station in any way. They they just they were just protesting outside the petrol station. And when I asked them to give way so I can carry the casualties, the people did not create any problems for me whatsoever. They allowed me to pass through. So then I reached the office, uh, the um, offices, and I had to pass them as well. So there was a route that I had to go through. And when I reached the offices, they started. They were swearing at the people. And I actually witnessed how four or five of them were using batons to to beat up some people. And I was in an ambulance, and I wanted to pass and uh, reach the destination. They uh, blocked me and told me to take uh, um, a shortcut in various from through various little alleys and in a way they told me no so you you cannot go through the main roads you have to take the side streets in order to get to their destination the day after when i had finished my work and i returned home to rest And I saw that the Basiji militia, um, without, uh, as if they were they, they they could do whatever they want. They were they had a free hand, and I saw that they were. They were throwing tear gas towards the people, um, and uh, asking them to disperse. 
and they would threaten that uh, we will shoot you, and they did indeed. And from 5 p.m. until the next day, uh, th that carried on. And because of my work, because I had to go to different hospitals and collect the bodies of those who had uh, been uh, shot to take back to the mortuary. I saw that people had turned out in the streets peacefully and they had no weapons. But the special forces of the IRGC besiege police force were using water cannons and weapons and they beat up people with batons. They were not afraid of anything. It was, they didn't care what happened to the individual that they shot or beat, beat, beat up. Even if they, if they felt that you were on their way, they could just run you over. They didn't care whether you participated in the protests or not. That is to say, they used to beat up people so harshly and they chased people that uh, people had become desperate. They didn't know what to do. They sometimes jumped in the middle of the road and got run over as the forces were pushing them around. This is what I witnessed. Did you, is it? normal before the protests, would you ever find intelligence officers or besiege at the cemetery? No. Only during the protests they were there. and they had a special place for themselves. And we were asked to take the dead bodies to that particular location that they were based. And the fathers, the relatives of the dead bodies were also taken to the same place so that they would issue the necessary commitments. Their drivers were not allowed to stop on the way either and we were not allowed to take the bodies to the house of the individual, neither where we were nor the place where the individuals resided. And the uh, vehicle drivers then would have had no problem. Otherwise, it might have been a problem. Okay, and what about... We were not facing similar conditions and protocols before. It was during this time that only we saw such a thing, that family members of the dead had to issue commitments. Before protests, there was no such thing. And the routine of our work was that the um, relatives were referred to the officials just to get a number. But no commitments was taken from the relatives and that they were not allowed to hold burial ceremonies or the like, or that we had no uh, right to stop anywhere at the and to take the bodies to the homes. And also mourning ceremonies was uh, banned and uh, families were not allowed to use black color and to use um, some means for morning this was only something that happened during the protest so with with regards to the um intelligence officers and the security that were at the cemetery how quickly did that change from so when did you notice that they were first there was it on november 
Um, on the 15th, the 16th, what, what day did you notice the change in their presence at the cemetery? Uh, on, uh, from the very first day. Mr. Chair, witness is yours. Thank you, uh, Council. Uh, Ms. Rohan? Uh, thank you, and Mr. Witness, and, and good afternoon, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, I, I have only one question, and that's that you mentioned in the statement that you gave that on, I, I, I guess it was the first day of the protest, but at some point at the beginning of the protest, you were on your shift going to the hospital when you saw security men who were burning banks and breaking the glass at bus stations. And I am wondering and would like to know how it is that you believe these individuals were security people as opposed to protesters. What I said was about the first night when I was on the shift. Because this was something that did not happen during the day. The shops were open, people were around, the shopkeepers were around. So those who broke the windows and glasses had military uniform. They had guns. They had motorcycles, the type of the motorcycles that they were riding on, the batons that they ha were carrying, all were used to damage the property. They were breaking the glasses of the banks and the bus stations. They even broke the car glasses. Before that, before attacking people, The people were there. When they attacked people and the people retreated, and the officers got to the place where the people were, that was where they started causing damage. They tried to show as if people had caused the damage and left. So if actually saw individuals in military uniform, burning banks and breaking the glass of bus stations. That was how you identified them. Yes, they were special unit, the anti-riot unit. Uh, Justice Jakub. Thank you very much. Um, I have just one question as well. You said, I think, at the beginning of your evidence that people were just supposed in their cars to stop them and switch off their engines to make a, a, a fuel-related protest, as I understood you. Um, what I'd like to know is ben. who decided this, where did it come from, what did you mean when they say people were supposed to? Because who said, who said to them, this is what you are supposed to do, this is what you are not supposed to do? And if I misunderstood what you said, please tell me. During previous days, there was somehow people called through 
uh, media, through uh, social media, to turn out at a particular time in different parts, wherever they were, to turn out in the streets, to the main streets, uh, wherever they were, to turn out, turn off their cars and stand by and to show their protest by blocking the road. So they had no weapons and they were not involved in any conflict. And the security officers, even though there was no um, action by people, they started shooting at people. They even even, even shoot uh, bullets in, into the air. They immediately started shooting directly at people. So there was no discussion, no warning. They didn't even ask people to open up the road. They just took action by shooting directly at people. People were confused why this was happening. They hadn't even chanted any slogans. Against the heads of the state or the system. But they were harshly confronted by the security officers. So the suppression that you could witness on the first hours by the use of the uh, water cannons uh, and also the, the, besieged, the, 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 the officers on motorbikes um, was extraordinary. They attacked people. Uh, people were, uh, were shocked. They thought that they hadn't done anything to be confronted in such a way. Many people were just bystanders, were just passing by. And they were just trying to flee the scene in the hospital or elsewhere. That is to say that people were trying to resort to the hospitals not to be get shot. They were snipers at the top of the police stations or some other buildings who were, who were shooting people. These snipers did not pay attention who they were shooting at, whether the individual was young or old whether the individual was taking part in the protests or not. They just shot at people. It seemed that they had the order to shoot in advance. They, have re they had received the order to shoot in advance. People had not even attacked any police station or whatever, but they acted as if the people had uh, attacked to occupy a certain police station or a barrack. That's how they confronted the people. One more follow-up question. Did anyone shoot at anybody in their cars who had switched off their engines? Well, the people had left their cars, so they were standing on the side. They had gathered in one place. Nobody was in the car at the time, and they did not care. The security officers did not care whether you were in a car, whether you were just passing by or whatever, whether you were a shopkeeper, whether you have a car, whether you're walking. They just shot at people indiscriminately and uh, there were many people who were shouting i could hear that during the hours of my shift i s saw people running fearing that they may be shot at because they knew that there was no immunity the situation was in such a manner that you would n not consider yourself as immune. You could have been shot at any time for, what, for no reason. Even me, who had a uniform on for the job I did, I was afraid to be shot at, but I tried to be in a place not to be seen easily by these security officers so that they would not shoot at me. Thank you very much. You have been very helpful.
Zanovic. I think that's it from the panel, Council. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Witness. That's all the questions we have for you. Thank you very much, Mr. Witness, for coming to testify um, about very difficult subjects. We appreciate your testimony and we'll take it all into account. Thank you.